So that's a really tough act to follow. Um, but I'm uh, talking about UI design, so at least I think I'm in the right room. Um, my name is Quinn Law Holtman Kramer. I'm one of the co-founders of a company called Pluot. At Pluot, we make super affordable, super easy to use video conferencing hardware. And I've been obsessed with designing tools that support collaboration for 15 years. So thanks for having me here talk about that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to rewind a little bit in the history of computing to show one of my favorite photographs ever. These are two of the first professional computer programmers. I think this photo was taken in around 1944. And these women are working on the ENIAC computer. In some ways, this kind of makes sense to us as a photograph. We've really gotten used to thinking about things in terms of Moore's law, the idea that colloquially, colloquially at least computers get faster and smaller and cheaper all the time. But the really kind of shocking thing from a contemporary perspective about this computer is there's no screen. Like there's basically no IO. This is not an interactive machine at all. And in fact, it took a really long time for computers to get interactive. Let's uh, fast forward 40 years to 1982. This is one of the first computers I ever used, the K-Pro 2. It had a cutting edge green screen display that measured nine inches on the diagonal. Uh, and in theory, it had 400 by 192 pixels, but you know, that kind of oversells it because there was a fixed character set in the display ROM and you could only put those glyphs in particular 80 by 24 column and row positions. So UI design on the K-Pro was really about fixed width text layout. And if you were really super clever about maybe animating that fixed width text, this is a game called Ladders that shipped on the example utilities something disks that came with the K-Pro and it was awesome. But only two years later, the Macintosh changed everything. This was a computer that was built from the hardware up to be a graphical computing environment. And the Macintosh development team did an unbelievable job. The operating system and the systems libraries supported a consistent and legible and really elegant graphical user interface. Uh, when Steve Jobs was doing press for the Macintosh launch, a reporter asked him, Steve, how many man years, they said man years then, how many man years did it take to write the QuickDraw libraries? And Steve went to Bill Atkinson, who wrote QuickDraw by himself. Bill, how long did you work on QuickDraw? And Bill said, I'm off and on for four years. And Bill went back to the reporter and said, it took 24 yeah, man years to write QuickDraw, uh, which is a perfect Steve Jobsism, but also kind of true because Bill Atkinson was a programmer's programmer if ever there was one. And QuickDraw is absolutely beautiful, as was lots of the stuff that went into inventing this GUI that we all still use today. 30 years of iterative evolutionary progress with some dead ends, bring us to this computer, which I use, and I'll, I bet a lot of people in this room use every day, the 27-inch iMac. The screen on this computer is gorgeous. Uh, the dot pitch is pretty close to paper. The color rendering is phenomenal. It's, I think, a pretty good argument could be made that it's the platonic ideal of a desktop computer. But it always makes me think a little bit of this artifact from an earlier era of engineering evolution. This is the Douglas Aircraft DC-7, and it was the last piston-driven propeller airliner that Douglas shipped in 1953 at the dawn of the jet age. This was the culmination of decades of really great engineering, and it was obsolete when it took its first takeoff taxi because propellers were peripheral to the future of aviation. And desktop computers are peripheral to the future of computing. I have one of these and one of these and one of these, and I use them interchangeably to get my work done, like I'm sure everybody in this room. And I have one of these and one of these in my office and one of these in my living room. And my thermostat has a microprocessor in it and runs a nifty little operating system and talks to the cloud and has a really beautiful little screen. It was not very long ago that microprocessors and pixels were a scarce resource and they were housed in that unitary desktop computer, but now they're an abundant resource and they're everywhere. All of us in this room design applications that run across lots of different screen sizes and devices with different capabilities that are used in different contexts. And this is the UI design challenge that I've been obsessed with since I was a graduate student. What do you do with all those pixels? 
in uh, 2006, I started a company called Oblong Industries with a friend from grad school. And we wanted to answer that question. If you have an infinite number of pixels, what can you do? So we built some new input devices and we shipped a lot of systems to Fortune 500 companies and museums and classrooms and we open sourced a bunch of the libraries we wrote for networking and IO. And we learned a ton about what we started to call multi-user, multi-screen, multi-device computing. The thing that surprised me the most was that no matter what our big corporate customers hired us to do, at the end, what we were doing was solving for them collaboration challenges. The problems that everybody had, whether they were doing big data stuff or scientific visualization or building really great marketing environments, was how do you, how do you work better with your colleagues? We live in a world where everybody works on digital devices all the time and with increasingly distributed colleagues. So how do you take all the data and all the programs you use every day and work better together? And in 2012 or 13, I started to sort of notice that everybody I knew at big companies and small companies was working more and more with remote colleagues and as part of distributed teams. And I thought that was really, really interesting. We have these great digital devices and we have ubiquitous networks and that means we can work with people anywhere. But it doesn't necessarily mean we've solved the challenges about how to do that well. Uh, about a year ago, a small team of us started prototyping a new video conferencing device, a super easy to use, super affordable way to set up a work environment like this for any size team in any company anywhere in the world. We wanted to take some of the power of those million dollar rooms we'd shipped to com customers when we were at Oblong and give them to everybody. Uh, which has been a lot of fun. We did a quick and dirty industrial design. Our friend Koi, who was between jobs at Wildfire and Adobe, did a logo for us and a bunch of UI building blocks intended to run on screens of all sizes. This is a mock-up of a quiescent screen running on a TV. This is a first boot sequence mock-up, again for a TV. Here's two people screen sharing to a television. Here's a web browser controlling a big screen meeting and another mock-up of that. Here are some iOS screens. So solving these problems of how do you make interaction legible across all kinds of different screens with multiple people using a system at the same time is kind of fundamental to what we are trying to do. It's back to this problem. And I really like this problem because First of all, it solves a pain point that I have and everybody I know has. How do you work better together with remote colleagues? And secondly, it's this really elegant distillation of the multi-user, multi-screen, multi-device problem. I just want to sort of highlight three things that I think are particularly interesting about this, at least to me, and that I would like to hypothesize are a bigger and bigger part of the work all of us are starting to do and will do more of over the next few years. First, these environments are really sort of physical in ways that writing code that runs on one device isn't. Um, you have people sitting back from a television screen, kind of obviously, and you have laptops at arm's reach and you're holding phones. So to, to take advantage of all those screens, you have to sort of figure out what that means. And even more surprising, perhaps, when you click on something, say, on, your, on the phone you're holding and something changes on the TV that's halfway across the room, that's new to most people. It's new to most of us as UI designers. It's definitely new to users. So you need to build a bunch of breadcrumbs in about action at a distance. On the one hand, we understand that from the physical world. If you throw something across the room, something happens on the other side of the room. But throwing user interaction is new. A second thing is that multi-user control of these systems, anytime you have a bunch of people all collaborating around something, is not the sort of user interface paradigm most people are used to. We get the question a lot from first-time Pluot users, but who's controlling the system? And the answer is everybody or anybody, because if you have a laptop or a phone out, you can control what's going on in the room. And that takes them getting used to. So we have to build breadcrumbs in for that. We have to sort of make that legible through the user interface, that multiple people can be sort of controlling the same system at once. We don't ship a plastic remote control with a Pluot we expect you to control the Pluot with your phone or your laptop or your tablet or maybe in the future your watch or your AR glasses 
or your branded Pokemon device. And uh, the third thing I'd say is that it's actually really hard in some really interesting ways to design interfaces that work across long distance. Um, for example, all of you, I'm sure, have been on a video call where somebody starts screen sharing and then immediately says, okay, I'm sharing my screen, can you see it? You shouldn't have to say that. And I, I certainly don't think that's a problem that in the macro we've solved uh, at Pluot, but it's one that we will all collectively have to solve as we build more and more of these types of applications. If you are working with somebody across a large geographic gap, your tools need to reduce all of the friction points possible for that, for, for the, the remote work experience to really be fully satisfying. This is really fun work. Uh, I'd be remiss if like Yelp at the beginning of this talk, I didn't say we were hiring. Uh, we'd love to talk to you if you like working on this kind of stuff too. And we do have a demo back around the corner and uh, we'll be here as long as there are people to hang out and talk about UI design. Thanks very much for having me.